Yeah, so I'm Aggie Haynes. Uh, as Alexa said, I'm a researcher and a designer. Uh, and I make a lot of work about sort of the future implications of nascent biomedical and healthcare technologies and how they affect how we sort of view the human body, particularly the sort of representation of those kind of technologies. Um, so for me, I suppose, like, the introduction of these kind of technologies uh, are almost fantastical, um, quite amazing. And they do have this sort of um, impact on how we view the body as potentially a fabric which is sort of pervious to, to design intervention. Um, so for now, uh, I, I mean, I'm based in Plymouth, um, which is a university, and I'm on a course called Cognovo, which is a sort of transdisciplinary course with a lot of people from sort of neuroscience, psychology, uh, various different topics, um, and I'm being supervised by media theorists, uh, neuroscientists, and two dentists, which is sort of quite interesting from a design background to sort of have that different sort of input. Um, so for me, the sort of separation between these sort of seemingly divergent uh, disciplines as well as views of the body, so how things like this sort of organic world and now the synthetic world are sort of becoming much more permeable, um, makes it really difficult to sort of define the human body and how different things enter the body and whether they're sort of incorporated or not. Um, so in dentistry in particular, don't worry, I'm not going to be showing you that many pictures of teeth, but um, these kind of like integration of certain internal wearable, wearables sorry, uh, has been sort of going on for a really, really long time. And this picture is actually of George Washington's dentures. Um, he really famously wore dentures and a lot of people thought that they were wooden, but actually they're made of lead and horse teeth and cow teeth and human teeth and bits of ivory. Um, and what I found quite interesting about these dentures is that you can actually see how this wearable sort of uh, affected the ex external structure of his mouth. So the sort of thing that's been put inside has this effect on what's, what's going on outside. And, and this is kind of visible in a lot of paintings of him. Um, but the same thing happens the other way as well. You know, external things can affect the body, so that's how things like epigenetics, the sort of ideas in epigenetics are sort of very popular. And the body, it definitely has a plasticity, so it can be sort of stretched and stitched and sewn to create sort of different forms and different shapes. And again, as, as I'm guessing a lot of you are designers, this is really interesting to sort of work out how the forms and shapes that are made can affect the function. And this is, of course, very sort of prominent in how how things like surgical procedures work, you can make a slight alteration to have this effect. But also, uh, for me, it's really important to think about how we represent these things um, and how the particular roles that people take in, um, in visualising this sort of research might affect how we view the future of the body and whether we sort of actually want to further the, these sort of lines of inquiry. So we don't really want to lose the sort of vulnerable human values that come along with these sorts of representations. And a lot of the work that I do, I spend a lot of time thinking about how we present the body and how other people have in the past. Um, and as my dad says, who's also a sculptor, um, that I spend a lot of time making mud look like people. <laughs> uh, but it, it's... In, in sort of surgical procedures as well as biomedical and healthcare sciences, there seem to be a lot of similarities with sculptural techniques um, that I thought might be quite interesting to sort of bring up. So the body itself is sort of capable of things like regrowth and regeneration, um, which can be seen in these sort of amazing rhinoplasty techniques, um, the, the images where they've essentially borrowed skin from elsewhere to build up other shapes and structures. Um, and this has sort of uh, gone on to like uh, other levels, so surgeries that involve sort of borrowing parts or essentially using the body almost as a farm to, to create new materials. Um, so people like Carol Gillies, who worked a lot with people who had suffered injuries in war, um, he, him and the guy before, Dr. Cannon, sort of utilised this technique called creating a pedicle and what he would do is he would cut a section of the skin. So here he's cut along the neck, fold it over and sew it, and then allow the piece underneath to heal. 
And then essentially once that healed, you could cut off that extra se section of skin and almost use it as like modeling clay, which was quite amazing because it means that you could sort of build up other areas of the face, which is sort of a, quite a sculptural technique of sort of creating alternative shapes. These sort of things that are happening in surgery uh, uh, has become sort of quite influential, I think, to a lot of artists and designers, uh, including myself. And I was sort of interested in how people might decide to go about doing these sorts of procedures. So for the people who'd suffered war wounds, they want to sort of fit within you know, the bounds of social norms, feel comfortable, looking uh, more human. Um, whatever that means. Um, for me, I was sort of interested in, again, how people make these kinds of decisions and also thinking about the, the actual substance of the body and how, at what point might it be possible to actually sort of do these sorts of procedures. Um, so I started looking at, at children because babies uh, aren't really very well developed. Um, and they're, well, of course, they're developing, but their bones are still very soft, their muscles are very stretchy, their skin is very stretchy. And it's actually a very good point in your life to have a surgery or a surgical procedure. And there's a lot of people who are looking at things like, yeah, the chimera, the um, design of babies, or um, trying to create new functions out of uh, sort of body parts. But I, I sort of tried to think of things that parents might do that might essentially benefit a child later in life. So if you had a sort of environmental pressure, how might you modify your body or how might you modify your child's body to sort of deal with that pressure? So this baby um, has a, an aerodynamic face shape, which means that it might be able to live at high altitudes if there's a lot of wind pressure. Uh, this baby has a high head surface area to dissipate heat. So if in the wake of things like global warming, the world's getting hotter, could it live more comfortably? Like, you know, elephants have veins in their ears in order to get rid of heat. Could we do something like remove a toe? So in areas such as South Korea, there's a really high incidence of asthma. Um, and if you remove the toe, would that mean that your child might be more likely to contract something like hookworm, which is a parasite that can potentially diminish allergies? Um, or would it be helpful to do something like enlarge your baby's cheeks so uh, it might be able to absorb more caffeine, work for longer hours and earn more money? Or if it suffered from something like diabetes, would you think about uh, adding a new orifice to your child so it could absorb drugs over longer periods of time so it meant it wouldn't have to keep injecting itself? So both this project and the one that I'm showing you now were both part of my MA work. This short film, which actually Daniel is the lead surgeon in, my, in this video. And I, w I became sort of really interested in the sort of agency that comes behind these sort of, sorts of biomedical technologies. So this was a project where I looked at bioprinting, um, which I'm sure you've all heard of, but uh, it's, it's a technology that's that means that you can uh, culture cells and print them in different layers to form sort of complex 3D structures. So what that means is that you could take cells from animals and cells from the body or different parts of the body to create sort of things that it might take evolution millions of years to create. So this was essentially like a biological defibrillator it contained cells from an, an electric eel that could give you a shock that could uh, make your heart go back to its normal beating pattern. But again, as I said, um, these sort of, this sort of raised the question of agency. Would you be happy to have something like that in your body? Would you be happy to go through a really invasive surgery in order to sort of circumvent death? Um, or alternatively, in this project I looked at, would you be happy to sort of live alongside something that's modified? So this uh, sort of scene was made for a short, well, a one-night exhibition and um, the, it was looking at orchiectomy patients, so people who've had to have a testicle removed due to cancer. And I was interested in people who decide to have a prosthetic testicle after having, their, their, having that body part removed. Um, and they actually lose a lot of hormones that come along with that body part. So if you could do something like create a parasite that might you know, live off you, but also offer you hormones that, that are lost with losing a testicle, would that be beneficial? But more, you know, also would you be happy to sort of sleep alongside this thing, live along, alongside it as well? 
So these sort of structural alterations, as you can see, don't only stem from things like bone or muscles or larger structures, but also from really small things. So that's where things like genetic engineering or synthetic biology still looks at sort of creating these alterations that might have a lasting effect. Um, and that's sort of what I was interested in, in in this project that I did with two neuroscientists who were based at Erasmus MC in Rotterdam as well as a sort of weird group of transdisciplinary people. So uh, Jack McKay Fletcher, who's a computational neuroscientist, Christos Melidis, who's a roboticist, Sean Clark, a composer, and Marcel Helmer, who's another designer. We all sort of work together to sort of try and scan my brain um, and utilise this information to control a machine. So this is some of the MRI scan data. And what we essentially wanted to do was create an artificial neural network that was replicative of my, the 3D anatomical structure of my brain. And then yeah, using this network, control the decisions made by a machine, but also create an updating evolutionary algorithm that could update the network. But essentially what that means is that if we had something that, could, that was replicative of my brain, the decisions it would make over time means that it would alter the structure within the program. So if you suddenly woke up and your brain was in a toaster, or you woke up and your brain was in like a washing machine, you could see how the structure of your brain might change due to how the, how the machine makes decisions sort of thing. So we made sort of 720 nodes across the 3D structure of my brain, and these are the sort of connections between those nodes. And we used this information to control a drone, which was sort of quite interesting because um, as drones are a really hot topic, but also we thought it might be nice to sort of imagine this thing floating like the, my thoughts in like the gallery space. So this is me with my drone brain. Um, and even though it was really funny to sort of work on this project because it was sort of, I thought it might be a really uncanny experience. Um, we got into the gallery space and uh, Jack and Christos had managed to get it working and it was sort of learning to avoid walls or learning to be curious and move towards people uh, and then it popped <laughs> which was something that we totally didn't expect which was really upsetting so we still don't have a, a full amount of data that could see really over time how the structure might change but it might be sort of interesting to see what would happen to my brain there working in those kinds of transdisciplinary uh, groups is really fascinating to see whether people from different disciplines highlight similar topics and concerns. So whether people in design and people in neuroscience, people in psychology are sort of thinking about the same problems. Um, and in part of a residency at the Varg Society in Amsterdam, uh, I tried to see whether an audience might also raise similar questions. So they've got an, an anatomical theatre there, which is totally amazing. It's the oldest building in Amsterdam. Um, and so we decided to try and do some more futuristic uh, anatomy lessons in this space. Um, so we invited an audience to come in to this sort of quasi-simulation of future medicine, um, where we did things like remove cysts that had grown on bionic eyeballs uh, and then remove nanofilters that had been blocked full of sort of nanobots uh, from the lungs that you might breathe in if these things existed. Uh, remove a, a tooth from like a teratoma uh, growth in a leg and implant it into the mouth. Um, these are all silicon, of course. Uh, or uh, peel off parts of a head to reveal uh, a transparent piece of cranium which might help with um, neural surgery. So I sort of started by talking about babies, um, and I'm going to end by talking about the elderly, <laughs> uh, which would, I hope will nicely segue into the guys from IDEO's work, um, as this was a sort of collaboration with them. Um, and this was sort of a, a really interesting project. Uh, in, in, so I, I joined on to this, this work, which looked at uh, creating uh, this imaginary sort of company called Spirit, uh, which might encourage elderly people to be more sociable. So I helped sort of visualise some of the ideas that came out through this project, with the first one being an, an earlobe, sort of on-off switch. The second, a sort of proprioceptive um, area that signals could be sent to. And finally, a sort of fingernail with, with pigmentation that could sort of show you how sociable you've been over a sort of a certain amount of time. 
for me, this sort of comes back to this idea of need and desire. So a, a lot of the things that I might have shown you, sort of, um, some of them come from people who uh, that are really in need of sort of medical attention, and that seems like something that is perhaps more acceptable. But doing something quite invasive often seems sort of quite disturbing, and it's interesting to see what the role of the, des the designer is in asking what is needed and what is just desired, and, and whether either is important or to sort of to sort of take forward. And and I suppose that just to finish on a quick thought, that I think the sort of role of the designer is that. You've, you've been trained almost with a sensibility to visualisation, which means that you can offer input into how different research might move forward or not. And I think that's actually quite a, a powerful thing because it means that you can visualise things that don't perhaps exist yet and encourage people to ask questions about whether those things should exist or not, um, which I think is quite an interesting intervention. So, yeah, thanks so much for listening.